Welcome back to another Provident webinar. I'm your host, Ed Mann, Provident Director of Training, Director of Training and Education. I have Spencer Cheatham, former project manager for the International Association of Fire Chiefs Workforce Solutions, and recently appointed fire chief of the town of West Point, Virginia. He also serves as a manager for the Virginia Emergency Recruiting Network. There is no secret the volunteer fire service is having problems recruiting and retaining people. On some areas of the country, this has forced the closure of fire companies and other areas fire departments struggle to adequately staff their apparatus. However, there are some organizations who are flourishing and doing very well in their efforts to recruit and retain members. The question becomes, why are so many struggling while some others are flourishing? Has the model of the volunteer fire service used by so many simply ran its course? I don't have the answers, and I'm sure many of you are seeking helpful solutions to the problem. I'm sure Spencer will provide all of us some new ideas and thoughts on how we can improve our systems. In a few moments, I'll have Spencer introduce himself and give you some background on the work he did for the IAFC through the Volunteer Workforce Solutions. I'm sure we'll have plenty of questions and we're asking you to use the question answer feature to send your questions. We'll make every effort to answer all of them. However, if we don't get to your specific question, we'll get answers to you via email in the days following the webinar. I run through a couple of slides about Provident and then I'll turn it over to Spencer. Provident got its start in 1902 as a private insurance company, independent insurance company in the Pittsburgh area. And in 1928, they realized there was a need to be able to provide insurance to first responders, in the, uh, especially volunteer first responders in the Pittsburgh area. And they started to offer accident and health policies. Today, we provide volunteer combination and career firefighters and emergency medical responders with a multitude of programs. We also offer special risk and transportation insurance. We're celebrating four years as a top insurance employer uh, as voted by the Insurance Business Magazine. In fact, I do believe that uh, we received that award again this year. Some of the programs we offer, a 24-hour accidental and health insurance policy. So if you're injured while you're doing something for your fire department, we can help take care of your uh, financial needs if you're not able to work. Part of that is our first responder assistance program, where you and your immediate family members can get help with a multitude of any, things ranging from mental health issues to financial help and advice. A 24-hour accidental death and dismemberment policy that would provide coverage for your, your membership when they're off duty. Uh, a group term life policy, critical illness and cancer, and of course, our Fire Plus property and casualty insurance, which would entitle you and your membership free access to our fire, online Fire Plus training academy that's ho hosted by Fire Rescue One. So tonight, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Spencer Cheatham, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Spencer, you can turn yours on, and away we go. Let's get started here. Let me uh, share my screen. And so, well, Ed, thanks so much for, well, I have to ask, am I, am I sharing the right screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Looks good. All right. Ed, thanks so much for, uh, for this opportunity and to Provident as well. The, uh, I, I hope everybody's having a, a good night so far, and I promise I'll, I'll try not to be too boring with this. We're going to talk some about the administration of the, uh, of the fire service, so I'll try to keep that a little lively. So Ed gave a little introduction there for me, and, and I'll expand on that a little bit. So I've been in the fire service 27 years. Uh, I've been a volunteer all that time up until May 1st of this year. And, uh, and I'm one of those extremely lucky, lucky people. I, the volunteer fire department that I volunteered all that time for uh, hired a fire chief, a full-time fire chief. And, uh, and I got that job in, and started in May. I had uh, I'd risen through the ranks in the same department and had been the volunteer chief 
um, from 2000 to 2006. I also uh, had the opportunity to work as a career firefighter and then rose up the, through the ranks as well in another local department. So my department is the West Point Volunteer Fire Department. Um, and, uh, and then I got to work for New Kent Fire Rescue, which is one of our neighboring departments and, and rose up through the ranks there. It was a combination department and, uh, and I was fortunate enough to be in the, uh, in the first six firefighters that were hired. After that, I went to work uh, full-time for a, um, an industrial department and that was really boring. And then uh, a little over six years ago, I, I got to work for the IAFC, the International Association of Fire Chiefs. I came there uh, working predominantly on volunteer and combination challenges in the area of recruitment, retention, and leadership of volunteers. And I really, uh, I, I really got to learn that area. And the way I learned was by meeting some, some great people that really understood that area and, and what was going on in that arena. Um, built some uh, classes and a couple of award-winning classes, in fact, and, uh, and not me by myself, some of those, those great SMEs that, that really taught me a lot. And, uh, and that's how I met Ed. We did a class in Pennsylvania in 2019 and uh, on recruitment and retention, and that's how I got to meet Ed. But also I got to, um, one of the things that I got to do at, in the IAFC is I got to travel the country and, uh, and really dig in deep with a lot of departments across the country and, uh, and see what was going on. We did something called site visits and I got to go in and spend a couple of days with them. Got to really look at everything from their bylaws to, uh, to their membership. We talked, from, talked with people, the firefighter went up to the fire chief and including the guy uh, down the hardware store that had no idea about the fire department. So really got to dive deep into these departments. And so I got to learn about these different models and it's crazy. There are so many different ways that the volunteer fire service is conducted across this country. And, uh, and I was fortunate enough to be able to see those. What I, what I saw was a lot of good parts and some things that probably could have been done better. And at the end of each of these site visits, we did uh, recommendations to these departments on how they might improve their ability to, uh, to recruit and retain quality members. And overwhelmingly, uh, the issues that arise were uh, retention is key. Retention is nothing but good leadership. And if you fix retention, your recruitment will follow. Um, obviously, there's a lot in between there, um, and, uh, but, but that's basically what we found and, and where we try to focus our uh, attention on when we teach about that. So is Ben Franklin right for you? Well, you know, we hear a lot about how the volunteer fire service is in decline or is no longer a valid system. Um, that is certainly the case in some areas. But there are departments out there who do thrive. As I said, I, I got to see a number of those. And, uh, and I think sometimes when we think about um, our department and where it's going wrong, we tend to blame it and say, well, we're going wrong because we're volunteers. Or, or a lot of times that happens on the outside. Our local government might say, well, this fire department is missing calls. And so the first thing we need to do is hire firefighters. Well, I would say the first thing we need to do is take a look at our model and make sure it's the right model for what we're trying to accomplish. Um, if you think about it, there's some departments still out there using the Ben Franklin model for, the, for their organization. And, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means, but they really need to take a hard look at that. What I, what I don't wanna say here is, I, I wanna be clear. So there are departments that are doing great with the Ben Franklin model. And if that's the case, uh, you please continue on. If it's working for you, you know, uh, keep up, keep that up. If you're scratching calls or your staffing is inadequate or you're not able to get in uh, the people you need to get in, your quality people, you really may need to look at your model um, first instead of just giving up on the whole idea of volunteers. And uh, and so we're going to take a look at that. So. What is the Ben Franklin model? Well, uh, I'm sure you've learned from your uh, elementary school civics class, Ben Franklin, he really was a rock star. So 
1736, in addition to flying kites and everything else, uh, uh, in addition to all of that, and in his spare time, he helped form the, uh, the Union Fire Company, which is just outside of Philadelphia. And they set it up so that they were self-governed, self-funded, their members paid dues, they punished uh, their members when they missed meetings, and when the bell rang, everybody came running. And I know a lot of your apartments, including mine until recently, that's probably the case for a lot of them. So, but this, this model really took off. Within 40 years, there were 20 volunteer companies outside of Philadelphia with this exact same model. And it really lasted, this model lasted uh, for a significant number of, I would say even the majority, overwhelming majority of volunteer fire departments across the country for 250 years. Um, and so it, it wasn't until very recently that you started to see uh, a lot of departments going away from this model. So we talked about those characteristics, but let's explore why they might not work for today's volunteer fire department. And let's look also of how we might be able to tweak them or change a certain aspect of it to, uh, to build a good model for our organization. So first off, I have to, I have to break here. I'm talking about administration and some very dry stuff. So I'm sitting here, I'm trying to think, well, I can't put Ben Franklin with a fire helmet on every single slide. So I started looking up Ben Franklin memes and funny stuff. And so this is what came up. So I'm, I'm gonna keep your attention a little bit with some funny stuff on Franklin. So I hope you don't mind. So uh, here's Franklin's, uh, he's, he's a December calendar pick. So, um, so self-govern, what does that mean? Well, a large portion of volunteer departments across our nation are nonprofit organizations and they're separate from their local government. Now, I know there are a lot of departments that this doesn't apply to, but, uh, but bear with me on that. This, uh, this nonprofit organization can absolutely be a benefit for the department. It can be a benefit for the local government. And, uh, and, and generally what we're looking at here of why it's a benefit, there's a couple of things. So. A local government in general can't accept donations unless it has statutory authority to spend, spend the funds that are specifically donated. So for example, a donor can't give uh, money to build a park unless the government has passed an ordinance to build the park. They can't just make a uh, $500, $1,000 donation to local government the way they do to the fire department. So this is an advantage for the fire department and for the locality. On the donor side, uh, donations to local government are not tax exempt, so they're less apt to give. And volunteer fire departments thrive on donations, so they should definitely take advantage of this revenue stream. It's a, uh, it's a good way uh, to take advantage because they are nonprofit to use that to, their, uh, to the best of their ability. The other side of this is that local governments uh, tend to wanna be hands off when it comes to the fire department. And what I mean is that from a political standpoint, it's very, uh, it's very a positive nature or it's a very uh, a good attribute, attribute or characteristic for them when they can say that it's a separate in, in, entity. And so while ultimately they're responsible for providing the public safety, when the fire department is not uh, part of the government, they get the best of what, both worlds. So when good things happen, they can be quick to say, see what a great department we have. You know, I'm glad we fund them or I'm glad, you know, I support them. Um, but when bad things happen, the criticism may be even quicker. Um, you'll hear comments such as, oh, they're their own enemy. You'll have to ask the fire department, not me. You know, you'll get things like that. Um, from the fire department side, they can say, well, why should they they being the local politicians having a set, have a say in what we do, they don't know anything about our operations and or about how we work. And this is an odd refrain. So our, it's odd to say that because are we saying that each elected official needs to know about police operations? Um, does the mayor need to understand the inner workings of the water department? Most people would say no but there has to be a happy medium. Fire departments and local governments need to work together to provide services and department leaders should develop relationships with those who they represent, uh, that represent the people they protect and should educate them on how we meet our mission. And that's a key point there. 
it's the fire department's job to educate the uh, not just the local government, but the community on what we do. And we, we typically fall down on that, especially volunteer departments. So likewise, those representatives that, uh, that are the elected officials to the community, they should seek to understand what we do as well, and also what we can and what we cannot do. Um, county supervisors or town counselors do not have to become firefighters, but they, they do need to know again, what, it, what we can and what we can't do. Similarly, similarly, chiefs don't need to be politicians, but they need to know under, what the rules of the game are. They need to understand that politics has some certain guidelines. And if you think as a fire chief that you don't need to understand that, or I'm not a politician, again, you don't have to be the politician, but you have to understand how the game is played. So another common element of self-governed departments is they often appoint firefighters as their business leaders. And so what, what that, does that look like? Well, the president, the treasurer, the secretary, those are offices often held by those who also spend a great number of hours responding to and training for calls. And so this may have worked decades ago, but today's departments have seen a rise in call volume and training requirements. What we used to have to do to belong to a department and, uh, and be proficient or what was considered proficient then is not the same as now. At the same time that these training requirements have grown and our call volume has grown, the regulatory requirements for nonprofits and departments have, have significantly increased. So finding somebody who can meet both the operational and the administrative needs of the organization can be difficult. Now I will say it's not impossible. The, uh, the fire service just lost an icon who could certainly do both. Dr. Harry Carter uh, was an ex-fire chief who could certainly speak about strategies and tactics just as easily as he could speak about how a board of directors should be run. Um, and if you haven't heard of him, please look up the books he authored because they're, they're both great on uh, fire ground leadership. But he also wrote a book uh, called Running a Volunteer Fire Department, which is not about operations, but is what, which is about administration. So there are people that can do it. But if you don't have Harry Carters in your department, what should you do? Well, uh, I would recommend you consider reaching out to the community to find those with business skills. Uh, what we would call that are uh, administrative or business members. And you won't ask them necessarily focused on operations. They should be focused on, for example, you might have an accountant in your uh, local area that just wants to keep the books of the nonprofit, or you might have somebody who is a very skilled uh, CEO of their, or of their own small business and wants to be president of your department and can help out along those lines. So consider reaching out to them. You can have them join your board or your department as uh, one of those administrative members. And remember, they really understand finance, politics, and how to run an organization as a whole. And I don't mean that on the fire ground, but I mean from the business sense. Again, they don't have to run calls, they have to run the organization. And one way to think of it is uh, Elon Musk, uh, is he successful because he knows how to build a rocket ship? Now, don't get me wrong, he probably does, but he's not successful because of that. He has plenty of people who can do that. He's successful because he knows how to run an organization and bring all those people together to meet the mission. And so bringing in these people to run the business of your department can free up your firefighters to do what they want to do, um, which is train and respond to calls. So we talked about self-governed, but what about self-funded? Well, across the country, chicken dinners, fish fries, and bingo still goes towards the purchase of apparatus, fire stations, and fire equipment. Far too many departments ask their members to leave their family during the week um, while to run calls and then ask them to, to come and leave their family to come on the weekend to, uh, to hold a chicken dinner. And so that, that is a lot, especially for people that have families. I know a lot of people, uh, including myself, who as a kid loved the idea of being a firefighter. But when I think of that, I certainly didn't think of uh, bingo or I certainly didn't think of uh, holding chicken dinners. And don't get me wrong, I, I had my chance to do those things, but um, uh, that, that's not why people usually sign up when they sign up for the fire department. 
And so you have to ask yourself, are you losing good uh, firefighters because they're being asked to run a bingo hall instead of training on BES? Um, again, I, I'm saying this uh, with uh, from a, a, a large perspective of in general across the country, and there are absolutely departments that hold those things and do very well. But again, we're talking about departments that may be struggling and you have to figure out why you're struggling. So the other thing about uh, being self-funded is we have to ask, why should the fire department not only answer calls, but conduct the, conduct the fundraising as well? So if your department's doing that, it's a, good, uh, it's a good question that you should ask for your local government representatives. I'm not saying there's not a place for fundraising, uh, even if you get money from your local government. Perhaps your town or your county can only afford to buy you that $300,000 commercial chassis engine, but you want it to be a custom chassis with eight road arrays and gold leaf. Well, now's the time to, uh, to do some serious fundraising and throw those chickens on the big grill out back. So um, we previously talked about uh, getting business-minded people involved with your department. And, and this is an area where they can really shine. They're used to talking money and budgets. They see profit and loss sheets or financial statements on a regular basis. So let them talk to your political representatives about more government money for the fire department. And if your fire department hasn't sought local government money, uh, then it's gonna take a while to get up to where you need to be. And, and I would ask, and I would say where you need to be is your operating budget is funded by the local government and your local government is giving to your uh, apparatus or what we would call your capital improvement projects. Uh, at a significant level. And so I know that that might sound heretical to, to a lot of people, but really that's their responsibility. We don't ask any other section of government to, uh, to raise money for itself. And again, it's a balance. Uh, just because they raise money for you doesn't mean that they have to uh, uh, be a part of your department or, or have a say in your department. If you can run yourself well and show that, then they can make that as a donation. And believe me, that goes back to what we talked about before. Government, uh, the local officials are glad to write you a check and be hands off if they can. So take that into consideration and, and work towards uh, where you're funded by your local government. So the Union Fire Company also required their members to pay dues. Um, this is even more difficult to understand nowadays. Again, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of departments across the country. Almost every single time that I've had that opportunity, it's been because they haven't been able to recruit or retain new members. And so when you go in and you hear that they're charging applicants $60, and, and I'm not making this up, there are departments that that was the max that one department had charged, but they're charging $60 for somebody to join their department to volunteer, and they wonder why they're struggling with that. So often when you ask them, well, why do you, why do you charge this fee? It's often stated as the cost of doing background checks or some other administrative task. And that may have made sense uh, years ago when we had membership waiting lists, um, but there are too many non-fire service opportunities to volunteer that we compete with nowadays. And so we have to be, uh, we have to be competitive. And, and really look at how we can uh, make it easy for our, uh, our people to join. You, you have to look at the message that it sends when we tell people that you have to pay to volunteer for us, especially in difficult times. Uh, background checks, other administrative tasks associated with bringing new members, that should be considered the cost of doing business. And so the expense of these background checks is, is not significant. I know of one department that in addition to their state background check system, they use an online uh, background check system and they pay $200 a year for a subscription to that. And then it's 20 to $40 per applicant. They're a small department. They bring in about 15 people uh, per year through that application process. So for them, that whole thing is $800 a year, which for most of us isn't, isn't a huge amount. The, uh, in Franklin's time, his, uh, his department also punished people for missing meetings. 
Uh, until recently, that was uh, what, what my department did as well. We required people to attend meetings, but we didn't require people to attend uh, training. And so why is this? Well, uh, most volunteer departments, most nonprofits are, are governed by bylaws. And so those bylaws, they have a need to have a quorum, um, a certain number of members who have to be present before business can uh, be conducted. And so to ensure that that number is met, uh, some departments, they must require uh, attendance, including punishing those who miss certain meetings or miss meetings, uh, a certain number of meetings. And so while this is understandable in the sense that you have to conduct business this way, maybe you have to look at uh, making your meetings more accessible. Maybe you have to hold them virtually so that people can still be at home with their family and while they're watching, I don't know, Frozen or something, they can have their laptop on, uh, on their lap. Um, but you also have to consider if your department is still doing business as a, uh, a, an organization of the whole, meaning that everybody has to come in and vote, maybe it's time to look at a board of directors model for your organization. Um, and so the other side of this, it will show your, your operational members that their time is valued, and again, it'll let them focus on what they're trained to do. Again, this is, you know, what, what is this uh, we're trying to show people? Um, what, what did they sign up for? So I'll, I'll share with you that the very first meeting that I went to as a volunteer firefighter, um, we voted to purchase a, a $400,000 engine and it took about 30 seconds. And then that same night, we spent 30 minutes arguing about whether we're going to have a DJ or a band for the annual banquet. Um, and I thought some people were going to fight. I'll be honest with you, though. I, I loved it. I'm, I'm pretty weird. It was awesome. Um, but not everybody is like me. And so they probably don't want to sit through business meetings like that and, and might even question, what the heck am I getting into? So we have to be careful about uh, of how, that, how that's perceived by those people that we're trying to keep or get in. So all call. The, uh, you know, the age of the rooftop air raid siren was once the preferred method of letting everybody in the uh, community know that there was a call. And, uh, and that would cue the response from all fire department members. Everybody would come. And although most uh, departments have gotten rid of their sirens, many still alert all their members when a call comes in. And this is something that should be considered changing as well, or to be changed as well. Dec decades ago, when everybody was called out, it was for a major emergency. So alarms, EMS lift assist, trees down, um, those were unheard of then. Uh, now they compose most of our responses. Um, and so asking your, your uh, members and their families to be awakened each night when these calls come out may, may lead to no one coming out. Um, and, and think of this as the pager system. Um, most people don't get don't mind getting up and hearing that pager go off and answering it with, for a true emergency. But when they hear it every single night and it wakes them up and their loved one up, they end up with uh, a syndrome called turnover turn off. Now, I didn't come up with that term. I won't say who did, but it rhymes with uh, Tiger Schmittendorf. Um, side note, if you haven't been uh, to one of his presentations, again, Tiger Schmittendorf, or if you want to look up his stuff online, if you just Google it, uh, he's got about seven or eight different websites full of resources, just amazing amount of resources on recruitment and retention, and is certainly somebody that, uh, that understands that whole world. So, so back to what I was, this turnover, turnoff syndrome, that's when they hear what they consider, it's in the middle of the night, the pager go off. And they consider, they hear what they consider a non-emergency and they turn over and turn that pager off. Now, what happens two hours later when the fire comes in and they need everybody to respond is that they're not going to be there. And so um, you're going to have your people, if you're alerting everybody to every single call, you're going to, uh, you're going to have your people uh, wind up with this turnover, turn off syndrome. Remember, remember, their whole family is hearing it as well. So to combat this, uh, departments should try to cover nights with a duty crew. Um, fire alarms, EMS assists, many other calls, these can be handled by a two-person crew. And, uh, and I know a lot of people will push back and say, well, fire alarms, you know, that could be something. And in actuality, it could be something. 
Um, but I'll share with you, Las Vegas Fire Department doesn't go to fire alarms unless somebody has reported actual smoke or actual flames. They just don't do it anymore because they looked at the numbers and fire alarms, uh, they, they couldn't find where it, they, uh, they needed to do that anymore. And, and I think you'll know that a lot of departments uh, now uh, will send only one resource, the first due engine, uh, lights and sirens. And, and there's questions about whether they should go lights and sirens to alarms. Every, every uh, locality, every department is different. You have to judge what's best for your community. But, uh, but yeah, you should consider that that's probably just a two-person crew to handle until you hear that there's actual smoke or the water gongs going off or something along those lines. Um, those, that two-person crew, a lot of people, when I say this, think, well, we have to, they have to be at the station. Um, there's a lot of departments across the country that don't have bunk rooms, and that's okay. This isn't, this isn't necessarily that they have to be at the station, but they're the two people who are on duty. And when the call comes out for that single uh, unit resource, they go and answer those calls. And then it's a different tone. So when the pager goes off for everybody and it goes off in the middle of the night, the, the person that was, is not on duty knows, okay, it's, it's something serious and I probably need to listen and probably need to go. Um, that's your fire, your accident, that it's beyond one resource, um, or the on-duty crew, crew calls and says, hey, uh, you know, we, we need more help. Yep, we went on an EMS assist, but now, now we're doing CPR. So your people know that when they hear that call in the middle of the night, it is a true emergency. So what are some of these models that we can look at and, and really pay attention to, to make sure that we're choosing the right thing? Um, there's a lot out there, I'll be honest with you. We concentrated a lot, except for the all call part on the administrative side in your department. And that's absolutely, you know, something you should look at. But there's also the operational side. We talked about all call. There's a lot of ways to do things. So, you know, just response models, whether you're responding from home, whether you're responding from a pager or, or from, a, from your station, whether you, uh, your staffing is, is based on a percentage of calls, it's a point system, or maybe you schedule people to be on, on duty. Maybe it's every fifth night and every fifth weekend. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways to do it. Even training, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways to do that. And we tend to think of that Monday night drill as the, the standard for training for the volunteer fire service. But maybe it's time for uh, training to be performance-based instead of attendance-based. We tend to focus on you need X number of hours a year or you need to attend X number of drills a year. When in actuality, what we want is we want you to be able to throw a 24 foot ladder by yourself. We want you to be able to pull this minute man uh, on the two and a half and sit on it by yourself. Uh, you know, we want you to be able to from the time the air brake pops to the time uh, within two minutes you know, you've been able to lay out 500 feet of hose and hook to a water source. You know, those are the types of things we want to work towards. And, and we really want our training to focus on building up our people in that regard. And so we might have to change our model of training. Um, I know a department that has seen great success by changing that scheduling model of training. Instead of having the Monday night drill every Monday night, they do one month of intense training. So they do a night drill on Thursdays and they do four hours every Saturday morning for the month, for a month. And then they take a month off and that seems to work better for their members. The other thing that you might have to change is uh, in, your, in your training is the idea that, uh, that maybe we have to split up our training. So if I'm a new member, then I really need to concentrate on the foundational skills to do the job. And that might mean this is, these are the parts of the ladder. These are the muscle, uh, this is the muscle memory I'm trying to develop on raising a ladder. And so, you know, maybe that's for me, but if I've got five years or more on the job or, or really more than that, you know, if I've got five years or so on, you probably don't want to come to that drill. That sounds really boring. We're going to go over the parts of the ladder and sit in front of a PowerPoint. 
And so you have to think about offering your more experienced people something more challenging. Uh, maybe it's scenario based. Maybe it's going back and and again, popping that air brake from the time the air brake goes off. You're fully in your turnout gear and uh, and it's ladder drill. But within X number of minutes, you're going to have the 24 foot up to the uh, second floor of the training tower. Um, or maybe it's competition. Hey, here's here's this group here. Uh, you guys are the three person engine and we're going to see how fast you can do it compared to uh, to this three person engine. And so, you know, for your uh, more experienced people, consider having a scenario based or competition based uh, training. Again, that foundational skills, you can still have those for your new members as well. Uh, the other way that that departments can look at their model is uh, is certainly the combination fire service. So there are so many ways to do that. And I think, you know, we tend to think uh, in this black and white area, OK, we need uh, to hire people because we're scratching calls or we're having inadequate staffing at certain times. And the the thing that we tend to focus on is let's hire full time firefighters. Well, I would I would say that one of the things that you should consider, and I think most departments uh, fit this bill is instead of hiring full-time firefighters, you might want to think about hiring a fire chief and hold them accountable for uh, growing your volunteer base. Uh, now that's not always easy to do, but, but you, know, you, can, uh, you can have them uh, look at, uh, you know, how do we, where are we going wrong? And a lot of departments with retention, it's leadership. And it's not that there are, it's not always necessarily bad leaders, and sometimes they don't have the uh, time it requires nowadays to really put into building and growing these departments into what they could be and what the community needs. And so maybe if you're looking at a combination department, maybe the first thing you look at isn't hiring full time people, but it's hiring a fire chief. I think the other side of this uh, this combination world is uh, is it full time? Is it paid on call? Is it part time? Um, you know, you have to pick that model that's right for you. I'll tell you, uh, the the full time model, the the downsides of that are usually a fire department that's new to paying people cannot pay very much. And so they can't compete with the other full time departments in their area. And so what do you end up with? And it's no offense to these guys, but they they aren't very experienced. They probably got a couple of years out of firefighter one or firefighter two, and they're probably 22 years old. Now, I don't know about y'all, but when I was 22 years old, I'm, I was really stupid. Some people would say, my wife probably say I'm, I'm really stupid now. But I, if, if you stuck me and another 22 year old in a firehouse by ourselves, we would do nothing but get in trouble. And that's what often happens. And so you have to look at it. You know, is, is full-time firefighters hiring full-time firefighters the right step for, uh, for a combination department. Um, and so these are all areas. You have to look at every area of your department, the administrative, the operational side, to really see what's the right model for you and what can we change to really uh, move us forward. So as you can see, there's a lot of similarities, similarities between what Ben Franklin started in his time at Union Fire Company and I think a lot of times volunteers are we're really quick to blame society or other outside of uh, factors for our inability to recruit and retain quality volunteers when really we should look at the organizational model um, that we're using. So um, Ben Franklin, as I said, he's a true uh, American treasure, almost a superhero, and his department model was affected for most of the country for nearly 250 years. However, times have changed significantly, and there are few departments that can use that model now and be successful. So is your mod department using the Ben Franklin model? And if so, you have to ask, are you successful? Are you meeting the needs of the community? Um, and, and make sure that's, that's what you're doing, because that's the most important. Um, one last thing I would say is... Uh, you know, we, we talked about the early phases of the Philadelphia Fire Department here, and please keep them in your prayers. 
Uh, they're a great department, a great historic American department. And of course, they're struggling like right now with the loss of one of their firefighters, uh, Lieutenant Sean Williamson, and of course, five more injured. So um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer those. And if there's something that you need, uh, my email address is there. So uh, just let me know where to go from here. Ed, I see there's, uh, looks like a, a question in the comments there. Should I go to that? Uh, Sam won't let me turn my camera back on. <laughs> Sorry about okay. that. Oh, there, there we go. go. I see you now. <laughs> there we go. All right. So let, 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 let's take a look. We'll, we'll, we'll take the first question in the Q&A. Uh, is a company, Tom Shipman, if a company has limited training resources, do you have a recommendation for combining basic skill drills with more advanced training evolutions into one training night? Well, if this is Tom Shipman from Delaware, I hope you're doing well, Tom. And I still owe you some resources from a class. And I sincerely apologize because seeing your name uh, <clears throat> triggered me to, to remember that. So I need to get on that. But if it's not from Delaware, then hey, Tom. So uh, if, if your company, you know, if, if you want to combine your basic skill drills and your advanced training ev evolutions into one night, what I was talking about can be difficult. One of the ways you can keep those more experienced uh, firefighters involved is obviously, you know, um, have them uh, be the instructor, have them involved on that. And, and Tom says that's the same one. Well, hey, Tom from Delaware. But yeah, uh, have, have those, uh, those more experienced uh, firefighters be the instructors. But yeah, you might have to split it up some and, and take... Uh, your younger firefighters and uh, and just go over certain certain things with them separate, um, but it's a balance too because uh, them being able to see the uh, the uh, what what's actually going on on those uh, scenarios and with those uh, competitions that can be valuable as well. And so uh, there are some departments that schedule them. Uh, at different times, for example, the younger probationary firefighters might come on, come in a half hour early to uh, to go over those uh, those skills, those foundational skills, and then they go out and do the actual uh, evolutions after that. And Chief Caputo there, Nick Caputo out of Pennsylvania, he says that to try the NFPA 1410 evolutions. And that's absolutely right. You know, a lot of what we have is already out there and, um, and we, can, we can build off of those. And certainly NFPA has some great stuff to build off of as well. So here's another question. How do you keep young, this is from Eva Parker. How do you keep young members interested in drills when they're always the same? Our members get bored if we don't keep them moving but sometimes we need to review basic skills and build up to a more complex training the next week. Well, Eva, that's a great question. And I would say, um, you know, you can't generalize a group of people, but I'm about to. So uh, now younger people tend to learn differently. There's no one rule for everybody, but younger people tend to learn differently. And so maybe we have to uh, set that foundational level. Remember when I was talking about Here's the different parts of a ladder. Um, maybe it's a, just a YouTube video that you send to them beforehand. And, and so at the beginning of that drill, you just ask them, hey, here's the parts of the ladder. Did you watch this video? Okay, well, here it is. I'll share with you a story. And, and those of you who have been in my classes are probably tired of hearing this story, but, but I think it's a great one. So uh, Chief Juan Bonilla is out in, uh, in Idaho, and he's a great volunteer chief out there, does really well recruiting and retaining his people. And, uh, and part of initial training for probationary firefighters is understanding how to, how to run a pump. And they had a four-hour in-person class on a Saturday, and they had three or four uh, young uh, members that were going through this four-hour course. And he has a captain who does this four-hour course for him. And uh, so he's sitting in his office in the station and the captain, you can imagine, imagine this grizzled old captain coming in and throwing his hat on the, on the desk there and said, you know, I'm, I'm tired of these millennials and this, that, and the other. 
they aren't paying attention to me and, and, and they're, they don't, they don't want to learn and, and they're nothing like us and they're lazy and this, that, and the other. So Chief Bonilla, he is, he won't have any of that. I can tell you. So he said, well, hang tight. Let's just uh, see what's actually going on. So he goes out there and he said, Hey, you know, captain said, uh, y'all are, uh, y'all are out here and you're not paying attention to them. You're looking at your phone and, uh, and you're not, you know, really learning what you're supposed to be learning. And, and one of the probationary members pipes up and says, you know, I, I'll take credit for that chief. That was my fault. You know, I looked up on the pump and I saw the name there and it said water us. And I looked up water us on YouTube. And so, uh, you know, I found a YouTube video it seemed to show exactly what the captain here is selling us. And I, you know, messaged everybody around and we probably were all looking at that. And after, after looking at the video, they, they cut that four hour part down now to two hours and they require people to look at a certain videos before they come to this class. They quiz them a little bit on that. And then, uh, and then they go out and do the hands on part. And so, you know, we, we really, again, our, our current model or our previous model of doing things, how can we do it a little bit better? And the other side of that is I would ask them, what, what would keep you interested? You know, I can sit here as some old guy and say, well, this is the way we should do it, but everybody's motivated a little bit differently. And so you have to ask them that as well. So again, back to looking at the model, changing the model, something I tried the year before I retire as the fire chief, I'm fortunate I work from home with training is I started to offer training in the morning, starting at eight o'clock on a weekday. So the guy, the people who work night could catch that subject in the morning. And then I would offer the same program later that evening to the rest of the department. And we actually oh. opened it up to other departments in our area. And for a while it worked really well. And then to really change it up, I would bring other instructors in. So I wasn't the person teaching all the time and it worked for a while. And then we got into the middle of COVID and that kind of yep. screwed things all up, but it was a, a, another way of trying a different model instead of to your point earlier, we're going to train every Sunday or every Monday night, we kind of split it up. And it, again, it worked well for a while. Uh, Richard Barrett, uh, what, what are you seeing with regional organizations? This is due to staffing shortages. Richard, I think I know what you're talking about. And, um, you know, if, if if I'm not just just holler in the chat, but if you're talking about regional organizations in the sense of departments merging, you know, that, that was something when I'm when I was building this presentation, I didn't think of it. It's really the, out west. That is a huge thing. And by I mean, out west is you know, Oregon and, and some of these other departments that you have these large expansive departments because they've, they've started to merge together. And, uh, and, and that's really a great model to consider uh, because what, what that does is those uh, organizational, that business stuff that you have to do, you can combine all of that. Um, you know, my department, we have one station, we do about 850 calls a year, um, and, and a lot of, obviously, you know, most of those are EMS transport. It, it wouldn't be out of the question and I don't want to put myself out of a job, but it wouldn't be out of a question, uh, for us to combine some of the administrative things that we do, uh, as a nonprofit, um, if we combine that with some of the administrative needs of another department. And so you could combine that, you could combine training, uh, officers and, and that, uh, you know, section of your department as well, maybe uh, logistics with somebody keeping track of apparatus and equipment and PPE or the buildings, you know, all of those administrative things that you look at, uh, you could certainly combine and merge them together so that uh, they're taken care of in a more uh, efficient manner. And so I think that's certainly the case. On the operational side, the idea that you can uh, that you can work together with people that you're probably going to see a lot. So I, I know most departments nowadays there are very few that can handle a working structure fire by themselves without calling their local uh, their neighboring departments for help. Um, whereas I can tell you, 20 years ago at two o'clock in the afternoon, we'd have gotten 14 people within you know, 10 minutes on a, on a work and structure fire in, in our downtown area. Uh, but now we're going to get uh, two to four people 
And, and that's the case most of the places. So now if your department is merged together, um, you know, you're, you're just working with them on a more, more regular basis. You know people, um, you know their capabilities and you know them by the first name, which always makes it a little bit easier. So, Well, you know, to that point, Spencer, in some yep. areas, I know like here in Pennsylvania, we're kind of functionally consolidated with one another now because of the box alarm systems we have. Sure. Okay. I mean, I, you know, a, a, a first new structural alarm in my area brings apparatus from four different fire companies through three or four different municipalities. So on one hand, we're already kind of functionally consolidated with one another. All we right. really have to do is take it another step. That's right. You know, and, and and maybe consolidate some of those management functions with one another. So Absolutely. I'm going to take one more in the Q&A. And then we have a lot of people that have been hitting us pretty hot and heavy in the chat. The one guy's hit us three or four times, and I don't want them to think we're ignoring him. So Kevin Ferrara, we often see municipal government leaders, public agency, distance themselves from interacting with their local fire department, private organization, for whatever reasons. What do you recommend municipal and fire service leaders do to build stronger relationships between themselves? We could do an entire <laughs> webinar on that subject alone, but go ahead, Spencer. You know, I think you have to, if, if you're the department leadership, you have to seek them out. Um, and, uh, you know, this isn't my idea, but I, I truly believe it. One, one fire chief told me, you know, once a month, I, uh, I have uh, lunch with my county administrator, and, and this is a volunteer chief uh, with my county administrator. And I don't care if we talk about anything has to do with the fire department or politics or local government or anything. I'm just keeping that relationship going. And you can imagine how strong that is. You, you can imagine at you know uh, any time he can pick up the phone and talk to that county administrator uh, probably at a moment's notice because they've got that relationship. Um, you know, if, if the municipal government leaders won't seek you out, you seek them out. Um, and, 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 and I think I would ask, you know, why won't you seek us out? You know, there are departments out there that we've, um, you know, we, we've done something wrong. You know, maybe we've had embezzlement in our past, or maybe we've had something where we didn't do great and we have to move past that. That's what the community needs. And so you, you might have to take that step and say, hey, look, we were wrong in the past. We helped, uh, you know, in the case of a uh, embezzlement, let's say we helped prosecute that person. We put uh, new policies and processes in place so that that won't happen again. And we would we'll be glad to show you our books and be transparent about that. You know, that's just one example of why they might want to uh, be standoffish. But really, uh, you know, photo shots with the fire department and everything, you should really, they should really want to do that because the fire department are really uh, considered the good guys for the most part. And, and um, you know, we, we have the cool toys. So, um, yeah, I would, I would seek them out and find out, A, why they didn't do it and um, work, just work yourself to build that. It's got, it's got to start somewhere. And, and Exactly. And no need to wait on them. You take the first step. So Kevin That's or right. Jacob Heard, we're going to come back to you in just a second in the Q&A. I want to jump into the chat here and make sure we don't miss anything in the chat. Let's see. Uh, Larry Hensley, I believe it is. Uh, how, how can a local way to raise funds? I'm a councilman in Chambersburg. How can we bring more volunteers? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe Chambersburg has a small combination department, if memory serves me right. Uh, they have some paid people. I, they have a paid chief, I know for sure. Uh, but go ahead, Spencer. If Well, sh sure. First off, Larry, I would congratulate you. If, if you're not a part of the fire department and you're hopping on here to try to learn more, Wow, I want you to be in our locality because uh, that that's great. Um, even if you are part of the fire department and, and you're a councilman as well, um, congratulations! You're you're taking a huge step. Um, again, every department is different. I think um, you know certainly there are a lot of grants out there that really just need a little bit of help uh, to help departments out. Um, I know that localities struggle as well with uh, with funding. And so, uh, you know, 
you know, when I was talking about how departments need to move from fundraising themselves to uh, to bringing in money from their local government, obviously, you know, that that's going to affect the uh, the council's pocketbook. But I do think it's their obligation uh, not to pay for the gold leaf in the rotor rays, but to pay for what they need to to do the job. And so uh, you've got two questions there. How do you raise funds? Um, I think, you know, that that's something you have to look at uh, in Chambersburg about, you know, your your tax base and things along those lines. But there are a lot of uh, grants that can help those out. How do we bring in more volunteers? Uh, there's there's a couple books that could be written on that. Um, I would I would recommend uh, shoot me an email and I'll uh, I'll uh, send you to a, a class or somebody to a class um, that will uh, certify them to be a recruitment and retention coordinator. And I would start there. You need one person to concentrate on recruitment and retention. It shouldn't be the fire chief. It should be, uh, you know, one person that really looks at that. And I would start there and have them learn, just like any firefighter we bring in, we teach them skills, um, have them learn the skills to be a recruitment and retention coordinator, and then put them to work. So, so um, that's a very broad area. Go, I have to ahead. say this on the recruiting and retention coordinator class. I took the class that Spencer mentioned earlier, and, and I've said this a hundred times and I'll say it a hundred more times. It by far was the best class I've ever taken that the International Association of Fire Chiefs put on. I knew as a fire chief when I got there that there was no way that I could. I always knew in the back of my mind the fire chief could not be solely responsible for recruiting and retention. And within the first two hours of the class, it became crystal clear. You know, the fire chief has to be involved, but the fire chief can't be the recruiting and retention coordinator. And, and, and in this class, the other thing that, you know, there were people from out of state who were county employees, and that's what their job was, was to recruit and retain for the fire service. That was their job. They had nothing else to do with the fire department. They weren't firefighters. They were HR specialists that were in that class in, in Western Pennsylvania to learn how to recruit and retain for the, for the fire service. Uh, so, you know, to your point, Spencer, Mr. Hensley, if you're part of the council, I'm glad you're on here tonight. If you're part of the fire department in the council, stick with it. I recently did a courage to be safe class in Western Pennsylvania and one of the local township supervisors who doesn't fight fire set through the entire three hour presentation. Uh, and I made sure I made a big deal out of the fact that a local government official sat through the entire class. In fact, I had the entire class give the guy a round of applause for being a local government official that sat through an entire presentation that had absolutely nothing to do with local government per se. Uh, we don't get penalized for missing drills, but we have to make it a certain percentage of calls and drills. Uh, if that works for your department, Spencer, keep it up. Uh, if it doesn't, I, take a look at the model and see if there's a way you can uh, make an adjustment to the model. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I, again, it, it's all about tweaking what's right. And you might try, you know, this one thing and it doesn't work or it doesn't work as what you were doing and you go back to what you were doing. But, you know, again, we, we tend to assume that, well, that's not working. It's because we're volunteers. And, you know, um, when, when we, we need to tweak what, what we're doing, we, we shouldn't be scared to change if what we're changing to is going to make it better uh, for our community. So. Uh. Bill Hadley, here in our department, South Central Kentucky, a rural area, we've been doing a lot of split training for a while now. We think this is a great so concept that works great for us. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Hensley does go on to tell us he's not a firefighter, but he wants to help the department. And Larry Spencer said, get him an email. Sam will be sending all of the information tomorrow. Uh, thanking you for being here. And we'll have email addresses in there where you can contact myself or Spencer if you have other questions. Uh, and, and I know uh, Tom from Delaware had a great point. You know, when you want to get those uh, locality representatives involved, 
you can do just a Citizens Academy or a Firefighter 101. Uh, that's a great point, Tom. Yeah, Tom Shipman comments to everybody. We have we had a great experience offering a Firefighter 101 class for our city representatives, mayor, et cetera. The class consisted of very basic firefighter skills and really opened our eyes. Uh, here's another, Josh Pennypacker. My department, PA, recently did a demonstration for the township supervisors and it really opened their eyes. All the officers introduced themselves as, as well as the fire officers. Uh, okay, let's see. All right, now I want to jump back to Q&A and make sure we don't miss anything. I promise you, Jacob, heard we come back. My department runs duty shifts on the weekends with career staff covering calls during the work week. I've noticed that since we went to the weekend staffing, our monthly training meeting that has been traditionally held on Monday, on the first Monday of every month, has seen a decline in attendance. What's your take on getting rid of the training meeting altogether and having a monthly training topic that each duty shift must complete? Well, Jacob, I would uh, I would say that sounds like a good idea. I would, I would ask you first to ask people why they're not coming to the meeting to make sure that we don't assume the, the, uh, what the problem is. But I think you're onto a good idea there. How do you get it, uh, get it, turn an idea into action? I think, you know, if you're not the person to make that decision, then you have to sell it to the person who is or the people who are. And the way you do that is, uh, is get your ducks in a row and, uh, and present to them why it's such a good idea, especially the idea of why it would be a good idea for them personally. Uh, it might be, you know, Chief, we ought to try this new way of training. Um, we're, we're noticing that we're, we're missing out on Monday nights and, uh, and you've got a chance to build, really be a, known as a progressive chief and, you know, play up to them, compliment them a little bit. And if we implement this new new system, you'll be really seen as innovative. And I think we can really put you on the map to, you know, just play up to them a little bit and, and uh, see if they can. And also offer to just take it off their hands. Don't don't come to them. You know that you always have the chief that says, don't come to me with problems, come to me with solutions and be that solution. So, hey, I've got a plan right here. I've got it all listed out. If you let me implement this. We'll move forward and you don't even have to worry about it. I'll check in with you every once in a while. And um, I can tell you, uh, I would love to hear that. So, uh, that, but those are some ways to do it. I think you're onto a great thing there. So, so Spencer, I want to summarize. So going back to taking a look at the model, what I'm hearing here is, is that there are, there were four or five tenets in the very first slide about the model that we should look at. Yes. So we should look at, each piece of that model. Yes. Here it is. And, and so if, if, if a part of that's working, okay, leave it alone. If there's a part of that, that's not working, try to fix that part right. of the model for your department, you know, because a lot of times what we do is, you know, we'll Google it or we'll go talk to somebody right. in a class and they're doing something that works great for them. And right. we bring it home and it falls flat in its face because it just doesn't fit our demographic or it just doesn't fit fit our people. Absolutely. No, that, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. All these might not work for your department. Yeah. All right. I think it looks like we've got everything in Q&A answered. I think they're tired of us, Ed. Well, it's because you did such a good job. You know, a lot of, a lot of times when we have when we have this discussion, we kind of hash, we rehash the problems and you brought a different light to it tonight. It was take a look at the model that you're using and, and looking at these basic, you know, the five tenets that that the union fire company got started on. And and if if they're not working for your department, it's time to take a look at that piece of the model and say, okay, let's change this piece of it. Absolutely. And in some cases, you may have to start paying some part-time people the, because the it's community the only way has you're to come fix first. the problem. The community uh, has to come first. See, you know, so all right. I think we're pretty well. I, we got everything covered here. So we got the questions. Spencer, I want to thank you for a very informative presentation. I'm hopeful our listeners will take advantage of what we sh shared this evening. If you have any questions or additional resources from today or need additional resources or have an idea for a future webinar, please email us at info at provenantins.com. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. 
this wraps up another Provident webinar. Join us in July when Tom Lewis will join us from First Do, where we'll discuss the importance of data collection and how you can use it to benefit your organization. In fact, if you're using good data and collecting good data, it'll help you with these five tenets of the mo modern day fire department and what we should be taking a look at. If you don't have decent data, it's going to be tough to answer a lot of these questions. Would you agree with that, Spencer? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. For those of you who joined us tonight, you'll get an email tomorrow from Sam with some follow-up information. I'll also be emailing you a certificate. If you get your certificate and your name spelled wrong on it, please email me back and I'll get it fixed for you. If you registered with a bogus name, you're going to get a bogus name on your certificate. So uh, again, thanks for everybody joining us tonight. Again, thank you, Spencer. Thank you. As always, a great job. Thank Sam, so thanks much. for your help tonight. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Spencer. Thanks. Bye.